Hi and welcome back to another look at our hidden history. In this episode I will be uncovering what I believe is a cover-up so large, so incredible, it dwarfs the great Tartarian Empire. From the foothills of Peru, we travel directly back to the empire that was Tartaria. As if that was not incredible enough, I go further and deeper to uncover a deception that's been with us for thousands of years and one that maintains control even to this day. Instead of just stating that history is a lie, we delve deeper into the reasons behind that lie and why archaeology refuses to even look or contemplate at the evidence that so many have uncovered. Be prepared to have your historical view of the world changed forever. See you on the other side. Hi and welcome back and thanks for joining me on our continuing journey of exploration. Please like, share and subscribe and hit that bell and with that said let's begin. First I'd like to draw your attention to something hidden in plain sight. Something that allows the few to control the ideas, thoughts and assumptions of the many. And in order to fully understand the complexity of how such deceptions are achieved on such a scale with relative ease, it's important to understand the mechanisms used. I call it the splitting of our attention, the fragmentation of our focus, the division of holistic knowledge causing confusion in our ability to see a clear picture of our past, present and therefore the future. And I believe it is or was planned and is deliberate. To understand this idea of how to hide something in plain sight, we first have to look at how it came about and the same methods that are used every day, even now. So let me explain about this fragmentation by giving an example of the tools used of concealment during the Manhattan Project, just as an example, and we'll move on from there. Like all top secret projects, the Manhattan Project was so secret, the overall reason for its existence had to be kept that way, even from those involved in it. No one person knew the overall picture. This idea of need to know was born out of the need to maintain secrecy and hide in plain sight the goals of the overall project. And as some of you may know, the Manhattan Project was a research and development undertaking during, the world, during World War II that produced the first nuclear weapons. And this need to know or compartmentalization of tasks and information made sure there would be no one person who could spill the beans, as it were, on what the overall project was about. Now, let us take a closer look at the principles involved in this splitting of tasks and knowledge from a historical point of view. The easiest way to keep a majority of people in the dark, as, as well as we know now, is relatively simple. Divide up the information in such a way you never allow anyone to see the complete picture. Our ancestors, historically speaking, had stories handed down to them from one generation to the next. And in the best oral traditions through songs, stories and cultural traditions, history was kept alive. From writings on cave walls to codices of South America to the Sumerian tablets, these all gave an overall image of life, history and what we call a cultural memory. Hieroglyphs depicted the life and times of whole civilizations, thus allowing us to gain an insight into a much bigger picture. Now fast forward to a time of the mud flood and to the late 17-1800s, through to the early 19th century, 17-1800s, through to the early 19th century, we were given the gift of education. Or were we? I propose we were force-fed the same conditions as those working on the Manhattan Project. We were given a single slice of the overall picture and that slice was overcomplicated to keep us from looking at the big picture. The picture of who we are, where we came from, and what we could be. We are still attempting to piece together the jigsaw of history because of this fragmentation. From geology and earthquakes to asteroids causing quakes, volcanoes to erupt and disasters to occur. 
But in order to understand this, we have to troll through geology, astronomy, volcanology, climatology, geology, and a myriad of ologies just to form a picture or a snapshot of a moment in time. We are compelled to sit in classrooms that fractured our holistic view of the past into tiny pieces, a kaleidoscope of confusion, if you will, which makes it almost impossible to gain a true perspective on our origins, especially when they've been altered, destroyed or deleted from the records. The Renaissance greats, such as Leonardo da Vinci, in my opinion, was really no different from most inquiring minds of his own generation. All right, I'll give him his due. He was really good at art. But the point here is he was interested in all things around him, exactly like we are today. His advantage was that he was not subjected to the fragmentation of our world and as the modern education system currently forces us to be. He had the freedom to completely cross and create interdisciplinary look at what the world is and just look what he achieved because of it. This is not about IQ. This is simply about access and freedom of information. We now have a system of confusion sold as education when its goal is to compartmentalise knowledge that should be connected. We spend our school days running from one subject room to another, one set of books to another, in a fragmented fashion which only serves to confuse, contaminate and convolute the facts and the figures in our own minds. We have to understand that history, biology, geology and every other ology is interconnected and if it was not for the fact that we were forced to specialise in a small area of life or the fact that we are encouraged to focus on a single profession causing a blinkered view of the whole, we would have a much better understanding of the world around us. The myriad of classes we took never actually allowed us to join up all the information. It placed the whole of humanity into separate boxes and effectively closed the lid and never the twain shall meet. And this is why we have doctors who have very little knowledge of preventative lifestyles and diets rather than having to go and run to a nutritionalist to ask about healthy eating. And this is why we have very few interdisciplinary collaborations which help us give a balanced view of things including our historical records and the true nature of our ancestry. Take Egyptology as an example. This whole area makes me angry for the simple reason it's a made-up ology. It has no real credibility in the grand scheme of things if we were to study it from a scientific point of view, and it serves only to perpetuate the distortion of the evidence of a particular region which places the achievements of great builders into a specific area of our world and does not allow for the possibility of those builders to be anywhere else. Just because we've drawn a line on a map, you have effectively sealed the box. Think about it. Why do we have an ology based on a country with boundaries drawn on a map rather than an objective look at the evidence in a particular region? It can only be to carpomentalize the information and restrict the connecting of the dots, which I will explain in this episode. The irrational conclusions drawn by those unwilling to shift historical opinion is made even clearer by the fact mummies from what we now call is Egypt, including Tutankhamun, did, in point of fact, have cocaine from South America in it. So trade must have existed between the two continents, and yet Egyptologists insist there was none. Clearly the evidence says otherwise. And yet geologists find evidence in North America that Antarctica was once connected to it, and that evidence, Antarctica was once connected to it, and that evidence is accepted. It seems clear in many cases of archaeology, it's there to back up what has been said before without rocking the established linear or singular view of humanity. People are convinced that Darwin's theory of evolution is a book of facts when clearly he states it's still and always has been a theory. Yet mainstream educational establishments insist on fitting the evidence to match the theory. And in my opinion, that's not science, that's dogma, pure and simple. Take the Sphinx of Egypt as an example. Clearly the water weathering dates this monument back to some 12,000 years, and yet we have Egyptologists who seem to have enough sway to contradict the evidence. 
I don't actually recall any Egyptologist having to study climatology or geology, which gives them, in my opinion, a zero credibility to purge judgment on the evidence of the Sphinx. I'm also talking about the fact that not a single hieroglyph exists inside the Great Pyramid indicating who it was built by, and those who built it currently live in that region, which I don't believe for one second. To be honest with you, personally, if I'd have built such a wondrous edifice, I would plaster my name all over it, as the Egyptians did later, for the world to see and remember it was me who built that. But no, nothing save a few scratch marks above the king's chamber, which in my opinion has got nothing to do with a king or hieroglyphs whatsoever. But I digress. But here's the biggest question for me personally. I don't think for one moment that all these academics are stupid people. They're very intelligent people. So the question then becomes, why would all these experts completely ignore what doesn't fit with the established views placed down in a time when science and technology was at its infancy and continue to perpetuate in the face of such overwhelming evidence the old stories, the old views, and not change with the evidence that's put before them. Unless, of course, there was a much bigger reason. And I will be getting to that one very shortly. Which brings me back to Peru and the polygon walls at the start of our journey over to Europe, Eurasia, and what is now called Russia, or as I mentioned uh, earlier, Grand Tartaria. We start our journey towards the land of Tartaria, sorry, Eurasia, far from the European landmass in the depths of the Peruvian jungle. We have all seen the megalithic sites and the undeniable skill of ancient builders of the now famous polygon masonry, which defy modern understanding of the construction methods that were once used. But taking a holistic view of the evidence allows us to draw, allows us to draw more accurate our own assumptions and here we have a repeating and common thread of, of similar construction across the world from Greece, North America, Europe, through to Italy, Germany, Egypt, and even through to Russia and the great Tartarian Empire. These structures repeat themselves time and time again. But we must also not fall into the trap of simply accepting what seems to have been found just because it's on the internet. Because I, along with many other researchers for truth, try and make sure we maintain objectivity. And on that note, here is a prime example of what I'm talking about. And some of you may already have seen this report. And as much as I would love to make such a direct connection with the polygon Peruvian wall builders to Grand Tartaria, well, take a look at this short video clip. So on my travels around the internet, looking for dots to connect those uh, Peruvian polygon walls to Tartaria, in fact, which was my original goal, I came across this piece of uh, footage that you can see there. Now, I've dropped the audio because I, I don't want to get an audio strike against me for it, but you can see here that they're reporting on an underwater find just off the coastline in Russia and as you can quite clearly see here it's only a three minute section here it was uploaded by a Socorro Warves vet uh, but let's see if we can just jump to uh, actually I'll just I'll just skip past this chap who you can see here talking about it because that lasts for a few moments and let's just get to the point I'm trying to make here and how wary we have to be as researchers. So there they are clearly telling us where the site is and it's been mapped um, and a, a little bit more information there. That's not what I'm concerned with. And I'm going to pause it because there's a very important bit coming up that I want you to take a very close look at. Um, those are clearly not man-made steps and if and you can now see those polygon shaped Peruvian walls under the water. That is an amazing image, which I will come back to later. But just remember what you're looking at there and we'll just move on to the next bit. Because as you can see, here is a perfect example. I'm going to freeze it there. Now take note 
of the particular joints in this wall and please take note of these one two three four five and a little one there so you've got six holes there but more importantly i want you to take a very close look at the damage that's been done to this particular stone over time because it's a very distinctive mark within this wall structure and those five marks there okay so just and we can, i can let it carry on and this chap is saying look what we found under the water etc 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 all right, so I'm going to pause it there for a second and then I'm going to jump back to uh, show you something else about this particular report. And if anybody you want to go to and watch this full video, obviously, if you're Russian speakers and I presume some of my viewers are, you can see that it's got 47,000 reviews already. It was published in 2012 and you can just find this on YouTube as I did and uh, go grab yourself the full report. So let me just stop that bit there for a second so here you can see inside my photoshop here the one two three four five six distinctive indentations in this wall and these unusual joints this is obviously a snapshot i've taken from that video and then i flipped and turned it around that's all i've done um, and this distinctive damage mark that you saw on the video now, if we go to the next image, you can quite clearly see, let me just get that out of the way for a second. Here is the distinctive mark on a wall that's clearly in Peru. I can assure you this is, in fact, Peru. And I took that previous image and altered the size, as you can see here. All I did was uh, just adjust it uh, to fit the actual scale of this wall, as you can see here. OK, complete with the let me just move that out of your way. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six on the green. Let me just up the opacity so you can get a much better look at it. Here we go. All right. So it seems a little bit coincidental, leaving these joints that you can see here match perfectly over here. And that slots in quite nicely there. And if I drop the opacity again, you can quite clearly see, well, see for yourself that that, sorry, my alignment's slightly out. There we go. So if I drop the opacity on that, boom, coming back, coming back, there we go. And you can see that that is clearly been taken from Peru and not an underwater site that is claimed in this video and it's this sort of thing that as researchers without you trying to make yourself um, you know perpetuate some of the lies that are clearly going on it's not just academia um, it's it's others as well I'm you know I'm not just against the system that keeps the truth from us it, it there are lots of examples of this and this is just another one of them which is sad to be honest with you because there's absolutely no need for this kind of behavior which brings me on to the second piece of evidence that you can clearly see here, and I don't think it requires much explanation. Again, this was purported on the report to be found in that underwater city off the coast of Russia. And clearly, you can see here that it was actually part of the stonework found in Peru, up near Machu Picchu, I believe. So, as I said earlier, it's not always great finds and you've got to do your homework and I do try to but what I'm going to show you next I have done my homework on and I think will absolutely blow your mind. For me this is where things get really interesting. So I would like to bring into focus another common thread apart from those polygon type of constructions that spans the world. And the efforts of many to throw this discovery out as just another wild theory and of an imaginative mind, I think will uh, think again in terms of the evidence that's put before us. Here you can clearly see the now famous elongated skulls. These particular ones were found in the foothills of Peru by, I think it was Dr. Tello some years back. But Bren Forrester, who has led the team researching the origins of what is now called the uh, Paracas Elongated Skulls of Peru, has had 
many of these skulls DNA tested at various universities across the world. Now, I was in contact with Bren this past week uh, in order to get his permission to show you his findings. And he graciously gave me permission to show the following video to my viewers. And I will let you have a look for yourself as to the origins and what it could mean before we head over to Tartaria. I may pause the video just to make the point clear at certain places that Bren makes in his short presentation here, since it's important to fully understand what skeptics are trying to make light of. And again, muddy the waters of what I believe is a historical discovery. And I will leave a link to uh, his research work in the description below. Hi, this is Brian Forrester coming to you from Paracas in Peru. And I want to give you an update as to the recently released DNA results of the Paracas people. Now it's taken us five years uh, since we began this process to actually get the results. It took almost three years to get, or two and a half, to get permission from the Ministry of Culture of Peru, who we worked with very closely, especially with archaeologist Ruben Soto, in order to have the DNA testing approved by the government. A total of 18 skulls was tested, and results came back from 12. The DNA was so badly degraded after 2,000 to 3,000 years that of the 58 samples of 18 skulls, we got results from 12 of the skulls from two different laboratories, one in Canada, the Lakehead University, and another one at UCLA in California. A third lab was also utilized at uh, Santa Cruz, uh, University of California, but they stated that of the, I think, 18 samples they were given, no results were forthcoming. We're, we're not sure if that's true, or whether the results were so bizarre that they decided to hide them. So, <clears throat> in what I can basically tell you is that um, all Native American people of 100% uh, Native ancestry are supposed to be and were of the haplogroups A, B, C, and D. So this is one of the Paracas elongated skulls. This is one that we believe is natural in shape. And as I turn it, you will see the complexity of the design. You see all that amazing curvature. And basically there's a depression here where the two hemispheres would be. The eye sockets are very large. And the, there's a lack of a sagittal suture here. Now, I just want to interject on Brian's great video for the moment, just to show uh, you viewers just how important, when he mentioned there's a lack of sagittal suture, just how important that is. Because as you can see here, that sagittal suture is on all human beings. It's how archaeologists date human beings. As you can see here, it says quite clearly, the suture begins to close at the age of 29, starting at where it intersects at the lamboid structure and working forward. By age 35, the structure is completely closed. This means that when inspecting a human skull, if the suture is still open, one can assume an age less than 29. And conversely, obviously, if the suture is completely formed, one can assume an age of greater than 35. This is standard practice used by archaeologists because it's something common to all humans. And as Brian pointed out there, and I'll show you again in one of his, a clip from another video, these particular skulls, or at least a number of the Paracas skulls, have no sagittal suture. And that is a major discovery. So the results that we got, um, <clears throat> four of the elongated skulls were of haplogroup B, which relates to uh, the fact that um, there was Native American ancestry involved, but the other ones were not. 
and uh, the most common haplogroups that showed up were U2E and also H, H1A and H2. If you look at where the most prevalent um, percentage of U2E and the H1s are, it is in between the Black and Caspian Seas, as in the Caucasus Mountains. And so that's very intriguing. Um, what I can also share with you is what I believe was the migrational pattern, because these people, like the some indigenous people of the Caspian area and Black Sea area, um, were and are dark red-haired and also very light skin and green eyes. And this seems to correspond as well with the elongated skulls. So I believe what happened was about 3,000 years ago, the uh, ancestors of the Paracas decided to leave the area because they were being invaded by someone. And so they traveled south through Iraq and Iran to the Persian Gulf, and there they wound up sailing eastwards and eventually found their way to the coast of Peru. There are different routes they could have used. They could have gone through Hawaii. They also could have gone through New Zealand, but then they wound up at the largest natural bay on the coast of Peru, which is Paracas, and that's where they decided to live because there was basically no one living there. They could live in peace, and that's where they developed their high culture. So this is only an initial um, release of information. There will be more. So now I hope you can begin to understand why there is absolutely no need to fake Peruvian remains under the water off the coast of uh, Russia. Because quite simply, this is more incredible. And as you saw in that clip there, Rin found the DNA structure of elongated skulls of non-humans in the area that was once Tartaria, which obviously could be called Eurasia, between the Black and the Caspian Sea in the Caucasus Mountains. So I would say that was absolute definitive proof that, you know, the there is a direct connection between the builders in Peru, uh, the master builders in Peru, and Grand Tartaria, or Eurasia as it, as it was, without having to fake anything. And I think that that in itself is pretty fantastic. However... Now, I know it would be easy to start claiming these are alien remains, but bear with me for a moment and let us keep this in line with the evidence. I will get to the non-human aspects in a short while. In the meantime, check a later clip that is basically confirming the infallible evidence of the fact that he has found some non-human remains. Take a look at this. And once again, you can see the... Uh the shape is different than a typical Homo sapiens sapiens skull, but the volume is more or less the same. So this is a noble person of the Baracus culture with cranial deformation. And now we're looking at this one. You can already see that the skull is larger than the one on the left, and there is absolutely no sign of the sagittal suture whatsoever. This is something that more than 30 physicians who have looked at the Paracas skulls in person can't explain. There has to be a sagittal suture, but it's not there. And as we go in close, or here you also see this protrusion on the forehead. And moving in closer, you see the coronal suture there going across the forehead. But there is absolutely no sign whatsoever of any sagittal suture. And as we look on the back side, you see these small bones, which are not typical of human beings. They are a characteristic of the Inca culture of Peru, but they're also found in the Paracas. Again, no sign whatsoever of the sagittal suture. So what Bren's showing us there is for me one of the most critical parts of the discovery and the DNA tracing back to Grand Tartaria. Remember, he said that those particular skulls were 2,000 years old, so that would put them as Tartarian. And more than that, I suspect that Hollywood knew long before these discoveries because they've incorporated them 
um, these exact same beings, as some of you probably know, in this famous film. And I apologise for removing the dramatic soundtrack, but this week, or this past week, has been an absolute nightmare on copyright claims, even for sound effects in some of my videos. So I'm taking no chances, and I just want to show you that even Hollywood has got a handle on these elongated skulls. And obviously, this brings us to the famous crystal skulls, which I've had the pleasure of holding one of those in my hands because I once worked with the granddaughter of uh, someone who'd actually found a skull in Mexico, which is now sitting in the Smithsonian Museum. But enjoy the, the clip. And I wonder how many of you remembered what colour eyes Bryn said in his research from his DNA there were in the elongated skulls. And I think you recall he said green eyes. And did you notice the colour eyes of the elongated skulls as he looked into the face of the woman? Anyway, so lucky for us, the evidence and the facts we have at hand in our current age of DNA testing and the clear evidence that more than a single type of intelligent or advanced beings were in fact living on Earth at the same time as Homo sapiens. Where they may have come from is for another video entirely, but I believe evidence point towards interdimensional rather than extraterrestrial. Bryn's evidence clearly and easily fit both human and non-human DNA by the simple fact that both species in some areas may have even copulated or shared genetic material. I would also like to add I believe the Earth has, over millions of years, seen many rises and falls of advanced races and that we live in a cycle far greater and longer than our history currently teaches or even comprehends. And all of those out-of-place artefacts or oo-parts clearly have a say in our distant past but are constantly ignored or refuted simply to maintain the dogma of the current era or, as you will see, are in place to hide an even greater truth that maintains this veil of secrecy even today. But let me get back to those amazing finds of Bren and take a closer look at the DNA results that leads us to the Eurasian continent and the land that was once Tartaria. Not only did he find a direct connection in this area of the world, across the oceans to South America, but recent finds within Eurasia seem to confirm his DNA results. The images you are now seeing is of a young boy found in Crimea in 2016. And again, there are those who would instantly claim this to be a traditional form of cranial deformation, a deliberate practice for certain tribes or as they're known as head binding. And this, my friends, is the problem we have to deal with because there are genuine documented cases of a few tribes displaying this evidence. So there is a slice of truth in which makes it harder to filter out the facts. But as I mentioned previously, we now live in an age where we can compare many different aspects and sources and not be confined to the old system of compartmentalization of our education. So what if some tribes practice this type of cultural deformation that does not follow that all cranial anomalies, as they are put here, are of the same roots and it does not follow that all skulls are shaped by this way of uh, head binding. And it's only an anomaly if your only point of view, Homo sapien, and the linear point of view of Darwin's theory of evolution. And as I've pointed out earlier, it's only a theory, and I fully suspect that there are more than one set of intelligent beings that frequent this planet, even to this day. 
Even with the explanation of head binding, there are some glaring holes in their cranial examples. First, as we have seen, modern science cannot explain the fact that there is no cranial plate joint found on all the humans at the point you see here. That alone gives us evidence that sceptics tend to ignore when citing tribal habits of head binding. These plate lines, or cranial sutures, are specific and common in all Homo sapiens, and in a number of skulls found in Peru, as it was pointed out, as you saw on Bren's video, is not the case. The second, the child found in Cry Crimea, um, you can see clearly has DNA links to the Peruvian skulls, was simply not old enough to have that level of deformation at the age unless he was actually born that way. And third, for me, which is the most convincing, is irrespective of the few tribes that practice cranial deformation, it would not increase the overall size and brain volume or capacity as you see in the examples found in the Paracas skulls or elsewhere in the world. It has been estimated that the increase in brain volume is approximately 53% greater than that of Homo sapiens. So, if we are to believe these are simply a result of head binding, then why aren't we all not increasing our brains to foster a 50% increase in brain power by slapping a wooden board on our babies' heads? It just doesn't make sense. Which brings me to the next important piece of evidence that throws out the attempts by mainstream academia to silence what's clear in the facts. And so now... I travel over with you guys to uh, Egypt and the images uh, Egypt and the images of Akhenaten, who, as you can clearly see, is of the exact same cranial shape of those found in Peru, Crimea, the DNA testing which brings those other ones to the Caspian Sea and other locations throughout the world. I'm not aware the Egyptians followed the same traditions of those local tribes of cranial deformation since there are no records of head binding uh, in Egypt. The mainstream argues that this could be a genetic anomaly. Well, if you're going to stick to the linear view of humanity, of course it's an anomaly. But if, if not, and if your mind is open to the possibility that there were more than one type of intelligent species on this planet and the fact that those elongated skulls, or uh, the slang term for them is coneheads, had the upper hand when it came, comes to intellect, which is hardly surprising if they've got uh, an approximately 50% greater skull and therefore brain volume than Homo sapiens. If you look at the reasons given by mainstream science, we have a few examples. In North America, one of the most prominent examples of painful beautification in the uh, Chinookan tribe Head binding occurred when the elite child, male or female, was first born and it was the responsibility of the parents to ensure this practice was followed. In another publication, the earliest examples of cranial deformation extend back to the Neolithic area approximately 10,000 years ago and the practice has existed amongst many cultures since. But the thing is, the idea that these people did what they did for various reasons has no basis in fact. There are no documented reasons other than the speculation put forward by modern archaeology. But, as you heard me say a moment ago, it was to the child that they came from an elite family line. Why was such a practice connected to being elite? Was it because the original elongated skulls were in fact more advanced and therefore classed as elite and possibly even gods, and they simply wished to mimic these beings? It sounds a lot more plausible to me than simply making guesses. But let me jump back to Tartaria for a moment. The Peruvian skulls and the local finds in Crimea clearly connect both of those locations to each other and clearly frequented by another form of of intelligent being and one with a greater brain capacity. This type of increased brain capacity would account for so much of our lacking in understanding of ancient technology and the manipulation of energy from the ether and could also account for the ease in which these gigantic stones creating these polygon walls were put in place with such precision in the first place. 
where we find this type of advanced polygon and precision construction methods, we find elongated skulls. We Can we really put it down to a coincidence or are the facts telling us something else? When we ignore the evidence, we do so to maintain the historical lies that keep us from knowing our true nature, our path towards humanity's true potential. And I firmly believe that the current powers hiding this knowledge are fully aware of these and many more connections. I also suspect the elongated peoples are still here and living amongst us, and additionally could be living in the depths of Antarctica. Digging in the ground is one thing, but what if we could find the descendants of this race much closer to our current timeline? Well, so I went digging to find some examples of these types of skulls in recent historical and contemporary literature and art, and many have been born to the bloodlines of the royal houses and worldwide controllers or the elite we see today. So here is a few medieval images that I don't think practiced head binding but shows the conical shape of those heads and as you can see here I've collected some examples of these skulls not just from better known finds as Peru or more recent periods but from recent periods in art and sculpture from around the world. It would be a real stretch if we were to believe the musings of academia that so many of these cultures so many years and miles apart all practiced head binding rather than being a completely different race which remains in the shadows and controlling events and information to this day. It would seem logical that if you wanted to remain unseen but maintain control then you would have had good reason to push the single line of evolution and keep prying eyes away from the fact that these elongated skulls are still here, still manipulating current world events and have a firm hold on established seats of power in finances, political, religious, military and clearly education in all its forms. Personally this makes more sense than the seemingly stubborn attitudes of traditional archaeology to stick to a narrative that quite frankly ignores the evidence gathered across the world from all ages past to present. The frustrating attitudes of established dogma now are becoming a little bit clearer. The mental capacity of the elongated skulls would make it easy work of what we find so difficult to fathom. The Tartarian tech shown in many videos now that's coming to light or the that's coming to light or the Eurasian advancement would more likely harken back to an age far more distant than we have imagined before. And each successive reset caused by natural events or deliberate disasters would somehow leave the survivors fragmented with this knowledge and they were left to make sense of it themselves. But could we not surmise the possibility that while we, Homo sapiens, act more or less as a slave race to these beings and are given a limited view of technology and knowledge, they have always and are fully aware exists. Shouldn't that be more plausible? It may seem ludicrous to assume that we've been lied to on such a scale it defies all rational thinking. But given the evidence and the connections of these dots, which seems more plausible to you? Darwin's theory or the worldwide facts that we too have been left to comprehend from the fragments of advancements of previous civilizations driven by beings not of humanity, but of a completely different race of beings, which has, for the most part, remained hidden for thousands of years but I fully understand that there's many of you out there thinking, well, this is all just speculation about a second race being in charge for thousands of years and staying in the shadows. So I'm going to flip over very quickly to a website and then show you a quick video clip because the bottom line is, if you don't believe what I'm saying here, then listen to what this lady's saying. And I'm just going to flip over to the website just to give you a quick piece of her background and then I'll play the video. So here we are on the website and you can see that the lady in question is Karen Hoods. She's a graduate of Yale School, worked in the legal department for the World Bank for more than 20 years. In fact, she was fired for blowing the whistle on corruption inside the World Bank and she held the position of a senior 
Council. She also studied law at Yale, economics at the University of Amsterdam. She worked in the US Export-Import Bank of the US from 1980 to 85 and in the legal department of the World Bank from 1986 to 2007. And she established the Non-Governmental Organization Committee of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association. So we're talking a lady that's got a lot of uh, academic history and uh, for that part, um, a lot of credibility. So I just want to give you a very quick clip of an interview that she did on uh, radio that was put onto YouTube uh, a few years ago and listen to what she has to say in terms of what we've been discussing in this video. If you look at the uh, picture of um, Akhenaten and his uh, daughters, the pharaohs, they had these huge headdresses. That was to hide their large skulls. They're hominids. They're not human beings. They're very, very smart. They're not creative. They're mathematical. And they, they had a much stronger force in the um, earlier Ice Age. You know, there are a lot of museums that have skulls of these, um, uh, some people call them coneheads by slang. Some people say it's more than one species. Um, it's pretty clear that that group um, is not able to, um, the off, they, they may produce offspring in, in mating with female humans, but that offspring is not fertile, or we would see more of these, um, these hominids. And they have been, um, you know, making themselves scarce. What you have is a world in which there are secret societies and secrets and the news and the information that ought to be public is not public. The uh, group called uh, Capensis, Homo Capensis, um, or Coneheads as some people call them, they were... They were trying to steal the world's gold. So it goes back to uh, Yamashita's gold, this whole story. It, yes, that's part of it. It starts off with Solomon, and then you get the Aztecs and the Incas and the Pharaoh's gold, and you, you, you then get all of the gold that Yamashita had. It's more gold than you know about. It's, it, the, wor the world is incredibly wealthy. Well, after hearing that, you couldn't make this stuff up, could you? I will leave the links in the description below so you can see the whole of the clips that I have mentioned briefly, including that very interesting interview. But it should be clear now that we are, I believe, caught in the middle of a battle between not one, but two different species, two different races. The number of elongated ancient bloodlines still maintain control. And for me, this explains things like why evidence is completely ignored all over the world. Why, out of all the countries in the world, the only ology is Egyptian, and simply this is to protect the truth at all costs. And why education is fragmented in such a way that it's so difficult to connect the dots. So I'm now convinced that they do maintain control, and maybe from a central point that we are forbidden to go. Maybe world and religious leaders are commanded to report to these beings and receive orders for the continued manipulation of Homo sapiens all over the world. And just maybe Antarctica is a lot more than ice. Together we can help uncover the deception. Together we can break the bonds of servitude. But we can only do it together. What part can you play in all this? Well, all you have to do is share this information, this video and other videos, not just mine, but anyone else's videos with everyone you know. And together we can get a look behind the curtain of deception. So please share this if you find it has been of value and interesting. I hope you actually have found this latest video interesting and informative. So please like, subscribe and hit that bell so you know when my next video is uploaded. But until then, question everything believe nothing and stay curious serious see you on the other side